Yeah, yeah. So uh, I want to get into then a little bit of, I guess, we'll, we'll start with the, the, the one work that he's arguably the most known for, uh, which is Deschooling Society, uh, 1971. Yes. <laughs> and uh, this is his uh, famous, now famous critique of education. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's making a very bold claim in that book, uh, which is that the uh, the standard um, system of uh, education through mass schooling is simply not going to be able to achieve the kind of aims that it seeks to achieve. Uh, and that ultimately some sort of new system, he presents it in the uh, in the form of in terms of practical solutions, uh, you know, a sort of peer to peer like learning yeah. networks, which yeah. are now more um, uh, closer to us technologically than they would have been at the time for him. Um, but fundamental to this is the claim that uh, that education is sort of fundamentally broken in a particular way. And he calls for the disestablishment of schools more generally. Do you want to talk a little bit about the core thesis uh, in his most famous work? And maybe we can get into some uh, some points on de-schooling society. Yes. Um, you know, I should I suppose it, we should be um, clear that in a way um, Illich is also constantly critical of himself as well so so he revisits his ideas at various points so even though de-schooling society for example and medical nemesis are very polemical books he will always later revisit his theses in the light of shifts and transformations so you know that he follows up um, de-schooling with after de-schooling what and you know to respond if you like to some of the criticisms which um primarily around the idea that, OK, he presents this very um, convincing uh, argument for for the disestablishment of schools, but doesn't in a way present enough of an alternative. Right. So he's he, I would just like to say, first of all, that he's very, very fully aware of, I guess, um, the limits of his own critique and, and, and constantly seeks to build on them. And, you know, so I guess one of the ideas is that if we have an idea of education, right, we, we must think that it's for something, right, maybe for, for an image of man, let's say, and he talks about this, like, are we trying to create particular kinds of subjects? Well, undoubtedly, you know, perhaps these are um, critical subjects, you know, people who think for themselves, perhaps they're, you know, human beings who have something like a moral education, who try to um, understand their own social role, for example, um, who have a sense of their relation to their environment and their context and community and all of those sorts of things. And we would have to say that this is very a very small part, if any, of the contemporary education system, those kinds of ideas of a certain kind of social embeddedness. You know, what we have is a kind of homogenizing system that tries to churn out, if you like, uh, almost interchangeable and again, homogenous types of people, all of whom have had more or less the same education, um, regardless, if you like, of people's skills or aptitudes or desires. And one of the things I think that the Illich, you know, because in many ways he is a traditionalist and this is kind of interesting to note, like he's a radical traditionalist, like he's he's not someone that you can simply describe as like a, a left liberal social constructivist or anything like that. Like he's absolutely not. He's always looking to the past in many, many ways. And one of the things that I think he's responding to is this um, destruction or elimination of what we might call social role. And one of my um, colleagues, Benjamin Studebaker, is always talking about this um, idea that what we have in modernity is, if you like, the collapse of social role so that people don't know their place. So and we also have a kind of hierarchy of values for the kinds of activities that people engage in. So, for example, in our current society, if you are a uh, an Uber driver or a nurse or a nanny or something like this. These are very, you know, um, service roles that are extremely uh, important, um, particularly those jobs that involve caring for other people. But they're also regarded as not being worth much in, a, in another sense. Right. Economically, we don't reward those roles in a particular uh, in a particularly good way um, that and what we have instead is a society that kind of encourages more and more people, and we've seen this over the last 10, 20 years, to get more and more degrees, particularly in the middle class, and to try to sort of um, outcompete one another in some kind of ridiculous, again, sort of screaming hierarchy of horror um, in which sort of any tactic is, is uh, 
I don't know, invoked in order to sort of help your child get ahead or something. Mm -hmm. And and actually then you end up with a surplus of highly overeducated people, basically, who actually then also don't have a role and become kind of very unhappy. Um, there aren't enough jobs at that level either. And yes. So, and you know, people have written about the PMC problem and, and luxury beliefs and all of these kinds of things. Um, so what I think Illich is, one of the things that Illich is trying to, I, I suppose, go back to or rethink is the question of value and where we place value in a society. And I mean, one of the reasons why I think de-schooling society is incredibly relevant now is because of the, the shift to homeschooling that we see, and this has again been exacerbated or accelerated by the the lockdown, in which we've seen, I think, a lot of families realise that schooling that their child is receiving, and they can see the kind of lessons that are being given on Zoom and all of these sorts of things, are just like woefully irrelevant, uh, inadequate, and you know, possibly even damaging in some ways. And I think what we'll see and what we are seeing is far more of a return to a kind of older system of, you know, private schooling, homeschooling, uh, maybe getting in an, a tutor or something to teach a few kids, something like this. But, you know, a kind of uh, decentralising of the curriculum, mm -hmm. which I think is very uh, potentially very positive, actually, um, because we don't need, I suppose, again, a, a totally homogenised people like why should everyone stay in school and be t taught the same thing to a particular age? It's not um, relevant. If we had instead a society in which everyone was integrated and valued in their different roles and status and, and capacities and skills, and in fact, those people who were actually um, helping more people were valued more. So let's say the, I don't know, the carpenter, the, the skilled person was valued more than, let's say, a CEO of a company or a bank or a startup or whatever um then we would have a society that was based on real values and real practices you know rather than one that's based on the totally irrelevant increasingly irrelevant um certificates mm. um, that that merely indicate that you've you've got you've passed some um some test in some set of ideas that are um in a way unreal you know that don't bear any relation to reality yeah so i i want to go off a few points on what what you said there um the the first being that what i'm hearing in all of this is that there's a kind of disintegration present in the way that we do education uh not only in again as you alluded to the you know the pace of education and the type of content uh that a student is exposed to uh, while they're while they're in school, pr particularly while you're in primary school and second and going into even going into secondary in many cases, uh, but also in terms of what exactly it's 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 preparing you to do after you're done, right? There's no, um, you know, we, we we may get into some of the his his economic critiques a little bit later, but uh, you know, as you pointed out, with these various jobs that you're going into, it's not clear exactly. Uh, what the status level is anymore of someone who's, you know, a nurse uh, versus, uh, you know, a baker or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, an architect or something along those lines. I mean, obviously, I guess we, we primarily would would assign certain jobs as, as being high value almost uh, all the time, things like doctor, lawyer. But even that is largely based on, you know, really how much money they're making. Right. And so when you compare that to the CEO, well, the CEO will, would generally be considered a more high status job, uh, even if maybe the actual effects that that CEO in particular is having on society might be worse, uh, <laughs> you know, than the Uber driver, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, it, obviously, all of these things are debatable. The point being that there, there's a kind of uh, dis disattachment from the actual, like you said, the role that you're actually going to play. And I think one of the things when we think about reforming education and we think about things like vocations, which is a word that I'd like to bring back into vogue, mm -hmm. uh, there has to be some sort of, uh, I guess, mutual understanding within a, a, a social group about the purpose of someone's role and the meaning that it provides, not only to them, but also to the group as a whole. Um, and so maybe that's just a consequence of us being in you know, large population centers, uh, you know, as you said, that there are 
lots of different uh, new modes of education that are arising as a result of, of the lockdowns and families wanting to innovate around that. Um, and I, I I'm, have some ideas myself about how we might uh, try to, for example, reinvigorate the liberal arts, you know, mm -hmm. provide more of a classical liberal arts curriculum to more mm -hmm. students. Uh, this is something that could be done very cheaply here in America, at least most of the schools that are doing this, uh, and there are many schools that are doing it, are still charging close to $50,000 a year to do so. Yeah. Um, so obviously that doesn't make sense for the kind of jobs that they can expect coming out of those programs. Uh, and if this knowledge is truly valuable in terms of its inherent value and the way that it shapes our citizens and the kind of reflections that they're going to have coming out of a program like that, I'm not saying everyone needs to go through a great books program to get a good education. That's just an example that I wanted to bring up. Then there's clearly a mismatch there between the um, the roles that are provided for for those kinds of citizens, if we want to cultivate those kinds of citizens. And uh, on the other hand, the cost and all the other um, various hoops that you have to jump through in order to attain that. And so, you know, any kind of way that I think we can make things more attainable or have the price more in line with the actual uh, value being offered, uh, or maybe even get, you know, hopefully on, on, on the, um, on the employment side, actually get get uh, certain aspects of the economy or certain business models in place that might allow the compensation to be made adequately for these kinds of things, uh, I think is a is a good move. Um, that being said, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, this idea of learning networks that he talks about yeah. in de-schooling society. Um, so he says, well, I, I'm gonna bring up a quote from Illich here real quickly. He says that a good educational system should have three purposes. One, it should provide all who want to learn with access to available resources at any time in their lives, which I think we're getting closer to with the internet. I agree. Uh, it, it's definitely moving in that direction, although I think actually what's going to be more important going forward is going to be curation of that content mm -hmm. um, because searching it out is, is becoming more difficult and discerning the quality is also becoming a, a monumental task in some cases. Uh, empowering all who want to share what they know to find those who want to learn it from them. And finally, furnish all who want to present an issue to the public with the opportunity to make their challenge known. Okay, so on the second point there, empower all who want to share what they know to find those who want to learn it from them. Again, we're getting more and more technological and infrastructure type tools specifically online that I think are really allowing that. Part of what you're doing with this course uh, is that second part there. But also, uh, I wanted to bring up this last point, which is <clears throat> give uh, you know all who want to present an issue to the public with the opportunity to make their challenge known. I think that latter point actually is moving uh, perhaps in the opposite direction of many of the first two points, particularly with uh, governments and corporations being more concerned about issues like misinformation spreading online and various arguments that are going on around censorship. Um, yep. Do you think that this uh, last point of the purpose of education that Illich proposes is uh, is something that we need to be considering when we're talking about sort of making more educational resources uh, available to people, making sure that those who have the knowledge are able to find ways of, you know, appropriately uh, transferring that knowledge to, to new students. Um, does this aspect of sort of public critique or the ability of the everyman, let's say, to present uh, criticism is that something that you know you think that we sh we should be wary of in terms of keeping that line open because it does seem to me like there are uh, there's an attempt right now to sort of close a lot of the ranks uh, around you know the the abundance of information that the internet has provided seems to be having a, a counteracting effect where there's a kind of uh, urge to sort of close the pay playpen if you might say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have to say I, I completely agree with your analysis and also with your interpretation of Illich in the present. I think this is kind of where I've reached <laughs> as well um, with these things. And I, I suppose, yeah, I mean, I agree that, that his idea of the learning networks is, is basically come to fruition, right? Like, you know, you can go on YouTube and it, particularly, well, if you want to learn anything, actually, you have 
often extremely high quality, enthusiastic videos that you can access so long as you have internet access, right? I mean, that's we shouldn't forget that that's also a, a, a you know, in a, a first step. Um, you know, you can watch videos of someone teaching you how to to make something, how to fix something, how to, you know, and they're often so well done. They're, they're people who are sharing their knowledge and their skills, um, you know, not only intellectual, practical, everything really. Um, and they're doing it out of this love of um, sharing, you know, and there's something so beautiful about that, you know, that people um, want to. And I think this is this is what human beings are like, like they want to share um, skills and knowledge um, that they have. And, and so I totally agree that on the one hand, we are presented with this actual real possibility for realizing learning networks and precisely these, you know, your podcast, I mean, uh, these sorts of para-academic or post-academic courses that we're running and many other people are kind of doing now, which are not even really opposed to the existing institutions, but really are very different from them. You know, they're much cheaper. They're they're motivated by uh, the will of anyone who wants to participate. You know, they're they're much more democratic. You don't need any uh, um, qualifications to attend them. They are purely based on enthusiasm and a desire to learn. And, and, and in that sense, of course, you can be connected with, you know, the eight people in the world who are interested in this one thing or the 40 people or whatever, you know, and there's something absolutely incredible about that, right? Like any interest, any figure, any skill, um, yeah, can be mapped and you can find the person or people who, who you, who were, are also interested in the same thing. Um, so I think we are basically there in certain ways and in, in terms of the learning networks and the kind of alternative to the existing education system. And, and since Illich is writing, you know, we have to note that those um, university systems um, have become even more um, insane in terms of their cost, the debt incurred, the, you know, the lack of value for money in terms of what you actually get, the, the lack of um, uh, employment consequences, um, you know, the the frustration and the disappointment that they generate and, and all of these. And I speak as someone, you know, who was employed in university for, for more than 10 years and um, all of those problems of bureaucracy as well. You know, even in the time I was there, they became more bureau bureaucratic, bureaucratic and the fees went up and, you know, so on. So that that's what that's what happened. And and in a way, probably I think we will see the collapse of of many universities in the next little, little while because of the lack of foreign students and so on. And but but on your third point, um, in terms of the the public thing, and it, yeah, it's it's there's also another point I suppose about the um, which is more a kind of Agambenian suspicion, I suppose, towards the an, an Illichian, you know, and he's very Illichian thinker, which would be I suppose the suspicion towards anything that takes place at a distance, you know, so for all of the beauty of the the online global networks and talking to people in different countries, it doesn't compare in a way to the intimate in-person dialogic conversation or the small group, you know, so I think, well, it, this relates to the third point, which is the point about the public and, you know, the discernment as well, like the idea of how, how to think critically and in a um, discerning way in a discriminatory way let's say about what is useful what is good what is beautiful what is true what is uh, important to learn and what perhaps isn't and the quality of learning and, and of course that does become harder for everybody when there's just a kind of plethora of information particularly when a um, one ideal one ideology dominates and mm. other voices are are being screened out or not shown or hidden from you or shadow banned or you know, and and this is a problem. So I've I've said repeatedly in in articles that um, we cannot um, make everything digital, and that would include original material. So books, I think we probably are heading for a, another. Well, we're on the we're in a, another period of of serious censorship. Um, so that people should kind of hang on to the analog copies that they have, the real copies that they have of books, particular books, even when we've got access to information all over the world. I don't trust these platforms to preserve particular texts that they will deem to be, you know, um, inappropriate in our age, if you see what I mean. So that so there's that that point. So I don't think we should, you know, ever get rid of books and records and those those real objects. Um, and at, at the same time, we shouldn't also get rid of the in-person conversations, the private conversations, the non-recorded discussions um, and those kind of uh, intimate forms of thinking with others. 
um, that are embodied and present. Um, not everything should be online. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I, I think we should be increasingly suspicious. I mean, I was just reading yesterday about how like PayPal have signed up with the ADL in order yes. to kind of potentially de-platform anyone with extremist views, but obviously one person's definition of an extremist. And I have been trying to tell the left this for quite a few years now that, uh, you know, if you don't defend people who are defending free speech and saying things that you don't like, they will come for you next. And we're seeing this, right? So anyone... You know, if you're a revolutionary Marxist and you're calling for the overthrow of the government, I mean, that's all very nice. But, you know, they, they will come for you. Right. Like just because you've agreed that you think anyone who's been deemed to be right wing, even if they are or not. Uh, and you're like, well, it doesn't matter because, you know, I disagree with them. They're evil people. They're bad people. You know, it, it, it there's no sense in which these platforms are going to stop at that, you know, and, and all all they've done, of course, as we've seen, is expand the definition of who counts as right wing. Um, and, you know, I was reading another document yesterday uh, from the European Commission, I think, which was talking about how uh, humour um, is basically potentially very dangerous and that we should, you know, instead of thinking that humour is like a release valve, we should actually... Unauthorised laughing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, you know, all of these things um, are, are obviously becoming more and more um, constrained. And these platforms, you know, these platforms basically are the state. Now, you know, there is no difference between the state and these platforms, and it would be ridiculous to think of them only as private companies who can do what they like. You know, they they are absolutely dominant. They make more money than most countries. Um, they basically are uh, reality in many ways. They're not reality at the same time, right? Because reality is us, our, our bodies, the people we know going outside the sun, <laughs> you know, <laughs> our spiritual being, our soul and everything else. Yes. Um, but... You know what I mean? You know, they're, they're very, very um, powerful agencies. And, you know, I think we should be thinking very carefully about how these form, these pla platform censorship and big tech censorship um, is is now feeding in very obviously into a potential social credit system um, and all of these things. I don't think it's paranoid or conspiratorial to think that we are basically about five minutes from you know, linking everything everyone said online to how they are treated more generally, yes. economically, socially and politically. Well, it's certainly on the menu. So <laughs> hopefully we choose not to take that route. But it's, yes. looking, like, it's looking like there. Are, I mean, yeah, it's looking like uh, there are there are a lot of eyes on uh, on the Chinese model right now. And hopefully we can we can bring bring the forces together to resist that as best we can. Um, yeah, I've been outspoken about, you know, uh, going all the way back to Alex Jones, you know, when he got uh, when he got shut off by multiple platforms simultaneously. And, you know, he even had financial services, you know, try to close his bank accounts and things like that. And yeah. uh, really what you're doing when you're denying things like financial services, this, you know, the particular partnership with ADL and PayPal is is concerning is you're, you're really just making it impossible for someone to have a livelihood uh, unless they're willing to sort of tow the party line, whatever that happens to be that day. And that I think points again to your, um, you know, your, your sort of exhortation to the leftists, uh, particularly anti-government radicals, whatever kind of strain of, of leftists you are, that, uh, you know, it's, it's inevitable that these tools are going to be used against you if they're being used uh, against people who are uh, dissenting at the moment for, for whatever reason. So you always have to be wary of that.